Credit Suisse is gone. At the time of this recording, UBS, the largest bank in Switzerland, just bought Credit Suisse for $2 billion. That's less than one sixth of the price of the stock just two days prior. Let me quickly catch you up to what happened. On March 10th, 2023, Silicon Valley Bank, the 16th largest bank in the United States, failed. Two days later, on March 12, 2023, the 29th largest bank, Signature Bank in New York, failed. The FDIC decided to come in and guarantee all deposits held at both banks, which amounted to over $300 billion. That is a lot of money. Wait, is this a joke? When these banks collapsed, the question on literally everyone's mind was, who's next? And is this 2008 all over again? The next bank people started to look at was Credit Suisse. See, Credit Suisse is considered a SIB, or Systemically Important Bank. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Which means that if it failed, it would trigger alarms across the entire financial world. This past week specifically was a terrible one for the bank. Credit Suisse announced that there were material weaknesses to its 2021 and 2022 financial statements. This caused the Saudi National Bank, who owns over 9% of the bank, to state that they will no longer inject money into the bank. And as a result, shares fell off a cliff. Oh, sell, 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 sell. The Swiss government tried to stop the losses by loaning Credit Suisse $54 billion, but it wasn't enough. Shares dropped an additional 24%. Then today, March 19th, 2023, UBS bought Credit Suisse for a damn steal. Credit Suisse is no more. But how did it get here? It's nothing like what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, which failed because it had terrible risk management or Signature and Silvergate, which also had a large exposure to crypto. No, Credit Suisse's problems go back almost squarely to money laundering. For decades, it was known as the bank that people went to when they wanted to hide their money. And finally, that reputation caught up to it. Let me give you a background to the money laundering that went on at Credit Suisse and just how crazy it was. Now, any conversation about Credit Suisse and its issues starts with the relationship managers. The bank had 3,500 relationship managers. Now, these are bank employees who specifically serve the rich and powerful. You have to treat these people like sensitive children. People like Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and your run-of-the-mill cartel leader. See, they don't go into the branch like you and me. No, they have relationship managers who handle all of that for them. And I can tell you from years of consulting for banks that relationship managers are some of the worst people at the bank. Sure, they bring in a lot of money, but if you try to get any information from them regarding the source of client funds, it's like getting blood out of a stone. Take for instance, Ronald Lee Fuxi, the former chairman of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. On its surface, that sounds like a good client, right? He's clearly prestigious, but like your mama said, don't judge a book by its cover because Ronald was convicted of taking bribes in exchange for listing companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. He was arrested in 1987 and convicted in 1991. As a result, he was in jail for two and a half years. Then in 2000, he decided to open an account with none other than Credit Suisse. When banks open accounts with people, they have to do what's called due diligence, which for even a crappy bank is doing a simple Google search of the client. Who going? Goo goo, ga ga goo, gee gee goo, go go go. This lets the bank get some background information on who the client is, so the bank knows who they're dealing with. Is this potential client risky, and do they have a reputation that we want associated with the bank? The bank is supposed to treat high-risk clients and industries with extra scrutiny and conduct an additional level of research. In big terms, this is called enhanced due diligence. Ronald's former job as the head of a country's stock exchange would classify him as a PEP, which is shorthand for politically exposed person, and as a result have to undergo enhanced due diligence. Other high-risk activities like gambling, weapons trading, financial services, and mining would also require enhanced due diligence. Again, part of this process requires searching the client on Google. If you do a quick Google search right now of Ronald, here's what you will see. Just a few results down, it's very clear he was not a client 
you should do business with. But somehow, Ronda was able to open an account at Credit Suisse without any issues. Then there's a German client, Edward Seidel, who was convicted of bribery in 2008. Seidel was an employee of Siemens in Nigeria and oversaw a massive operation that entailed paying Nigerian officials millions of dollars in order to secure lucrative contracts. When he was arrested, he freely admitted to the crimes, but still somehow he was able to keep his accounts at Credit Suisse for more than five years after he was arrested. One of the worst clients of Credit Suisse is this guy, Stefan Setterholm. He's a Swedish computer technician who opened an account with Credit Suisse in 2008. He was able to keep his account open for two years after his widely reported conviction for human trafficking in the Philippines. This scumbag was given a life sentence in the Philippines, but even after his conviction, his Credit Suisse account remained open and unfrozen. And we're just getting started. If you've seen my other video on the top 10 money launderers, then the name Ferdinand Marcos, who was number four on the list, would ring a bell. Marcos was the president of the Philippines from 1965 to 1986, and no strangers to financial corruption. Despite only earning a yearly salary of 13,500, Marcos became a multi-billionaire. He embezzled state funds, he received bribes, he monopolized companies, and he hid all his wealth in offshore accounts primarily in Switzerland. Marcos and his wife Imelda began the money laundering scheme as early as 1968, opening a secret bank account under false names William Saunders and Jane Ryan at Credit Suisse in Zurich. Marco and his wife started using state funds to indulge in a lavish lifestyle, buying luxury homes and collecting expensive art pieces, all while 40% of Filipino citizens were living in poverty, earning just $2 per day. He was so good at stealing money that no one knows exactly how much he stole, but it's at least $10 billion. Credit Suisse has no problem with holding his money. An attorney who actually helped the Marcos launder money, unsurprisingly, also had an account at Credit Suisse. She opened it in 2000, even though she was convicted of helping Marcos and his wife launder money just eight years prior in 1992. And this wasn't a small case either. The Associated Press covered the arrest and conviction, so clearly the information was out there. But at Credit Suisse, the compliance departments operated on a don't ask, don't tell policy. I don't know what you're talking about, but my gut says no. If you ask them one question and they give you a shady answer, or no answer at all, then as a compliance officer, you kind of have to follow up on it. But if you never ask the question to begin with, then there's nothing that could come back to haunt you later. Swiss bankers were sworn to secrecy. That is until 2007, when a Swiss banker came forward and essentially spilled the beans. He told US authorities just how skilled Credit Suisse was in helping customers hide their money and avoid taxes. Uncle Sam was not happy to hear this. According to the banker's knowledge, both Credit Suisse and UBS would go to high-end events to recruit clients, sometimes using free gold as a way to entice the customer to sign up with the bank. And you can bet the clients that were offered free gold weren't the ones you would see on the cover of Fortune magazine. So why did Credit Suisse, and to a large extent Zurich, become known as the preeminent money laundering place? Are the Swiss people inherent criminals? No. But Switzerland's history as a place to hide your money goes back to 1713, when the Great Council of Geneva prohibited bankers from revealing details about the fortunes being deposited by European aristocrats. In 1934, Switzerland passed their banking secrecy law. This made it a crime, an actual crime, to disclose banking information to foreign authority. Just look at the Wolf of Wall Street. Jordan Belfort, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, moved his money to Switzerland because as he was told plain and simple, no one cares where the money comes from. The Swiss will tell you otherwise though. Since 2018, they have adopted the Common Reporting Standard, which allows countries to share tax data. So Americans who hold accounts in Switzerland have their accounts reported to the US every year. That should solve the problems, right? Wrong. Swiss bank accounts are being used more and more by corrupt politicians in developing countries, countries all over Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And guess what? Many of these countries haven't signed up to be a part of the CRS data exchange. The infrastructure needed is honestly too much for developing countries and therefore, they don't know where the politician's money really is. 
And if you had to take a guess as to where the greatest percentage of Credit Suisse relationship managers are, what would your guess be? If you guessed the developing world, then you'd be correct. And there's no expectation that it's going to end. These money laundering schemes have cost the bank and I believe ultimately led to its demise. In 2022, the bank agreed to pay a $238 million settlement to French authorities for a tax evasion scheme between 2005 and 2012. Since 2020, the bank has had to set aside $4 billion in litigation costs, but that number is still growing, partly due to this guy, Patrice Lescardin. He was one of the bank's most successful private bankers. Specifically, he was known as the bank's man in Russia, and he was great at getting clients to sign up and move their accounts to Credit Suisse. But the fees he made from his clients just wasn't enough. He needed more. So he turned to stealing money out of their accounts to fund a lavish lifestyle, one that consisted of prized horses, cars, Rolexes, and shopping sprees all over. And since Credit Suisse didn't conduct any kind of investigation on its clients, the same went for their employees. There were multiple suspicious transactions attributed to that banker, along with four disciplinary issues, but nothing materialized. He was still employed and allowed to continue stealing. So where do we go from here? UBS now owns a very troubling and problematic bank. UBS shareholders who were not allowed to vote on it as per Swiss law because of a last minute change by regulators to push this deal through are likely not too happy. The broader financial market might see more giants fall before all is said and done. And in my eyes, could be Deutsche Bank. But don't think that Credit Suisse is the only bank known for being a haven for money laundering and tax evasion. UBS is the biggest bank in that country and it didn't get there by luck. No, the Swiss nature is deeply ingrained in that bank. More dominoes are sure to fall. If you're just getting caught up and want to know how the hell we got here, then you really have to watch this video, which shows what was behind the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and the dominoes that followed.